Well, I should say you've been extremely naughty, haven't you? What's up, everyone? This is the SML Podcast. I am your host, Joe. A uh, bunch of reviews to take care of this episode. No fucking around. Let's kick things off. Pernell Vaughn, how are you doing tonight, sir? Jazzy, spazzy, ready to kick off some Halloween candy thrashy. Holy fuck, that was really loud. Sorry. I'm, I'm <laughs> active. We, we got to make sure you switch from speaker to, to standard phone usage before we start the recording. That way the microphone like normalizes everything first. Uh, uh, uh. I probably started right after you said start recording. But yeah, I switched to the phone. <laughs> anyway, you're here to talk about a couple of games, and we're going to start things off with Etrian Odyssey 5 Beyond the Myth, developed and published by Atlas. It released October 17th on a Nintendo 3DS for $39.99. Journey Beyond the Myth and discover what awaits you at the top of the Yggdrasil tree. Etrian Odyssey 5 chronicles the quest of a new adventure as they attempt to reach the crown of the towering tree. For it is said that whoever braves the dangers of the dreaded labyrinth and reaches the summit will have their greatest wish fulfilled. Purnell, was your greatest wish fulfilled? Well, hell no, because I died too much to bother. So that that is the proof Etrian you Odyssey played way. the game. <laughs> yes, that is the Etrian Odyssey way. Get your ass handed to you. Yep, well, you're doing all right. Um, So leading this review off, if you've already been playing Etrian Odyssey games... You probably don't even need to listen to this review. You already have the game. And if you don't have the game and you're just waiting to hear a review, just buy the damn game um, because it's more of what you like. But for people who have no idea what Etrian Odyssey is, this is me talking to you, I suppose. So Etrian Odyssey is a dungeon crawler, but unlike traditional ones where the game maps it out for you, you are tasked with mapping the game out yourself or mapping the dungeons out yourself. And that plays into the game as a whole. But before we get into that little component, let's start with the outer shell of the game. So in previous Etrian Odyssey games, the they decided that they wanted to give you either sailing dungeon, like side tracks, so you could like sail around a world map or fly in a balloon around the map and find miniature dungeons and boss fights in addition to the Yggdrasil Labyrinth, which is a staple in every game. But in this game, they decided to go back to the roots. They took out the airship, they took out the boat, and they put you right back down to one towering labyrinth. That's the only place you explore, which is not a bad thing, unless you really needed a lot of things to do, in which case it's just an okay thing because the game is still fun. So you start out the game coming to this new town, and you are tasked with creating a, a team of um, battlers. Now, new to Etrian Odyssey is... In addition to your trademark staple of classes, you now also have races in the game. A series of races that all have different stat builds related to the usual stats of luck, hit points, TP, strength, intelligence, vitality, wisdom. And you have the Earthlands, the Ch Celestrians, the Therians, and the Brony. Now, each of those races has specific stat builds, like I mentioned before, and they're locked to a very sm specific set of the classes in the game. Four for the, um, for the Earthlings, and then two for the other classes. And, yeah. and one of those was Jabroni, right? I didn't mishear yeah. that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the Jabroni class. <laughs> race. I love it. Actually. That, that's what I heard. I heard Jabroni or possibly just Bronies. Yeah, it was Brownie. It's probably Brownie because it's spelled B-R-O-U-N-I, but now I want to call it Brony. So I'm just going <laughs> to leave it at that. But it's Brownie, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> um, so the way the game works is when you first make a character, you have to choose whatever um class is attributed to that race so no going outside the box however unlike in the old Etrian Odyssey games when you did you could do like respecking of a character which for those unfamiliar with what respects are is when you take a character who's leveled up and you sort of retire them and you set them back to level one and then you give them like another upgrade or as you today, no it's not the not the full retirement it's the, it's the different retirement where you lose five levels which is also in the other game so you would lose the five levels in the previous games, and by doing so, you would also have to get like a new. You could like reallocate your skill points. So let's say you felt like you didn't do a good job at determining what skills you learned. You would do that. Hmm. But in this game, once you get to a certain point, you are able to do the same thing, which is lose five levels and you know respect. But it also lets you choose another class 
that goes outside of the classes of the races available options. So now all of a sudden you can have a, a earthling necromancer instead of just a celestial necromancer, nice. which allows you. Yeah, and it gets pretty nice. That means they designed it so that the races, the stats for each race are at least okay for the classes they have access to. But to really get the gist out of the game and get knee deep into the nitty gritty, you have to start mixing and matching races and classes. And to further complicate mixing and matching, aside from the stat builds and what skills a, a class can attribute to those stats, you also have race skills now. Race skills are skills ranging from like world map abilities which is like say harvesting for harvest at harvest points fishing at fishing spots animal loving at animal loving spots whoa ho. um and, <laughs> and, either, either, and mining and mining spots but there's also something called union skills in this game which are also attributed to race skills and what union skills are is when you're in a combat scenario, you get into a scuffle, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, you're at 100% by doing damage and receiving damage, you can do a special type of skill where you and multiple party members gang up on a monster, or you and multiple party members boost everyone else's stats, or you and multiple party members do a group um, TP, you know, ability point heal. All sorts of different things you can do related to union skills, and you can kind of abuse it if you're smart, and you're going to have to abuse it if you want to be smart. So combat is a lot of fun in that regard, and they made one nice change to the game compared to earlier games in the series. So monsters in Labyrinths have strengths and weaknesses. They can be strong slash weak to pierce, blunt, slash damage, fire, electric, ice damage. That's always pretty much been the tree. Mm -hmm. And you don't typically know what those weaknesses are until you engage them head on. And then once you've bought the, you fought them, you go back to the hub and main town, and you can go to the guild and register your exploration results. And from there, you can actually see what enemies' strengths and weaknesses are. But you can only see them in the guild. You couldn't see them in the labyrinth. But in this game, you can, which is really freaking sweet because <laughs> I used to hate having to take notes on paper to know what actual enemies were weak against what without remembering them. It was a pain in the tuchus. So now, basi basically they're making steps to make it even more friendly to newer gamers. Yes, they did. And they actually did another thing that I'm not sure if the fourth game did this or not, and I just forgot. But this was amazing when I realized it. So previous Etri Nazi games that I recall, you had a max inventory of 30 items that you could carry. That means healing items, unequipped weapons and armor, key items, everything. You had 30 item slots at a time, and that was bullshit. I hated it so much because I'm a hoarder type. I liked carrying junk, and I never knew what I wanted to sell half the time. So I was always up full on inventory and constantly going back and forth to town. In this game, they went above and beyond. So now, in addition to having a storage depot at town, so you can just unload stuff in town, you have 60 inventory slots for items. You have a separate 60 inventory slots for food, which is also new to the game, by the way. Ooh. Food items. You can actually catch fish and cook it, catch animals, cook it, catch hives and cook them. I just made the last one up, but you get the idea. You can catch shit and cook it and then eat it and get health back from it. So it's like you can actually scavenge in the labyrinth for stuff that can allow you to press a little bit further without having to go back to town and do nonsense with that. So you got 60 food slots, 60 item slots, and then a separate inventory slot for key items too. So they designed this game to allow for maximum pushing through a dungeon before returning to town. And another thing they did that was new that makes it easier to deal with is in old games, the way they designed it was that you had to go, once you entered the labyrinth, you had to find various shortcuts to get to and from areas and whatnot. And once you left the labyrinth, unless you found like the warp shortcut to like say the fifth floor, because it was usually one each stratum, a stratum is a series of floors. For each stratum, there was usually a warp point to go back to town. But in this game, you can pretty much go to whatever floor you've unlocked when you return to the labyrinth. So as long as you can get out, when you come back, you can say, I want to go back to the second floor and just get back to business. I want to go back to the fourth floor and just get started. You don't have to keep retracing your steps to get back to where you left off like the old games did, which actually added a lot of unneeded time to the play experience. Oh, yeah, some people... Oh, my Lord, it sounds like they fixed nearly every issue that everyone may have had with the game at one point in time. They've done a yeah, they did a crap ton to make this game easier. So, which is not to say that the game is easy. 
<laughs> As I say, so now now the important question, you're talking about everything that's been fixed, everything that is fantastic about the game. Do you have any gripes with it? Anything that's not working right or any changes that they made that weren't that good? That's the sad reality of it. Maybe I'm just easy to please when it comes to this series, but no, I really don't because I've been playing Etri Nazi since the very first game. And aside from minor tweaks, like what I mentioned earlier about they removed the exploration, which does make me sad. I'm not going to lie. I personally liked having that extra option because it was never truly required to beat the game. It was just an extra thing to do. So it makes me kind of sad that they removed that, but I can understand why they would, which is they just want to get back to the roots and have less things to sidetrack you from the main goal. Like, go through the damn labyrinth. That's what we put you here for. (laughs) No balloons. No boats. But that's like probably the one gripe I genuinely may have about the game is that. But everything else is solid. They nice. kept the FOEs. The FOE music is still creep creeptastic. What's huh. an FOE for people who don't freaking know? So the game battles are random generated. As you're walking through a dungeon, ooh, there's like a gauge at the bottom right corner that's like a danger meter. And as you progress, it gets higher and higher. And once it taps out or tops out, you're looking about to get into a fight. So prepare yourself. But FOEs are different. FOEs are ridiculously powerful monsters, more powerful than the monsters on that floor. And usually when you first encounter them, they're too strong for you to actually be able to beat. They are visible on the world map and they have very, they have their own marching patterns. Some will just wander aimlessly without wanting to fight you. Some will chase you down. Others will just kind of circle a spot and if they see you, they'll kind of chase you out of their zone. But one thing is for certain, you don't want to deal with any of their shit because chances are if you fight them, they go Early fuck you up. They will fuck you up. They will kill you. <laughs> You'll be hitting the please run button and hoping to get away. So they are still in the game. They are still brutal. The game is still a challenge. Don't make the things I state, stated earlier imply that the game has somehow become easy. They did add a simple mode for people who just don't want to deal with the shit. But you're a pro. You're an Etrian Odyssey champ. You're not going to pick that. Very pick true. Next. So, But if you do pick it, I'm not going to tell them. <laughs> Secret safe with me. And you you mentioned the FOE music. Uh, I think just the music in general for the Etrian series has always been one of the high points. It really has been. Like I'm like the weird guy, though, where I feel like since when they went to the 3DS, it wasn't as good. And when I say that, I'm not saying that the music became bad or worse. It's just that 1 through 3, I think they all use Yuzo Koshiro, but 1 through 3 used Yuzo Koshiro, and it was more, the music was more crunchy, like more primitive, I guess I would say. So it gave me more of a classic sound feel to it. But the newer ones, the music is far more polished. And while that means higher quality, higher production values, and obviously just clearly it shows that there's technology is being pushed and it shows, I kind of yearn for the old sound. I yearn (laughs) for the crunch, you know. But again, that's a personal thing. But at the end, they're all, the music is all good. You're not so, losing out at all. The older games are Injustice for All. The newer games are the Black Album. Yes, actually. That's a good way <laughs> to put it. That's and exactly now, it. And now we're just waiting for a Death Magnetic to bring us back to the roots, and we're praying to God we never see Etri in St. Anger. <laughs> <laughs> We've almost come close. We've had Etri and Odyssey Untold, which is like the cover art for that, but the music sounds the same. <laughs> it's like, dare my dream, and then you put the games like fuck, <laughs> just like the other stuff. Or no, would, just, would the Untold games be like Garage Inc., where they're all cover albums or all cover songs? I guess they would be because technically it's the same songs, but they're different. They sound yeah. completely different. And like I've actually like listened to like to the Etrian Odyssey Untold One OST, and I go through it going, this is more polished, but I want the old OST. Is there a switch option in the game? Nope. <laughs> Oh, fuck this. I want my old sales back. <laughs> like, there was a floor. That's like, a, like the end of that game. When you got to the last stratum, the battle music was so scary, like legitimately scary. It was music outright telling you, you're about to get your shit beat. Like, that was what it said to the player when you got to that stage. You play it in the new one, the Etrian Odyssey Untold update. It was like, eh, this is another jam. <laughs> Have fun, guys. It's another battle for you. Like, no, this is no. No, we need the old, we need the old sound. I want to know, I want to piss my pants here. Not feel comfortable. <laughs> piss my I, pants with fright. This is probably the only Etrian Odyssey 5 review ever in the history of video game reviews that this game has been out where the game and the music has been compared to Metallica. <laughs> so I got to know, 
uh, for 40 bucks, which is the equivalent of like four Metallica albums, I guess they're about 10 bucks now, right? More or less, three unless or- you get one of those crazy ensemble discs that's. Yeah, three or four Metallica albums. What's your verdict? 40 bucks. Oh, grab it, pick it up, slap it up, flip it, rub it down. Oh, yes, you will enjoy this game, I assure you. If you're into dungeon crawlers and if you're into a decent challenge, but even if you're not, there is Simple Moat, which I did not test. But I would assume that Atlas put it there for a reason. So for the for the newcomers and the casuals, which, you know, it's good to have options like that there so that more people could experience the series. Oh, exactly. That's what I was saying. It's like I can't verify how easy simple is, but I know it's there, which implies that they they had to thought about how to make it easier. So I think it's worth testing if you're interested, but you're afraid of challenge. Let simple guide you. Nice. Well, we're going to go from a Metallica box set down to a brand new single with uh, the movie trivia challenge developed and published by LoadUpGames.com. It's available in the Xbox One Creators Collection for 99 cents, which is the cost of a new single. (laughs) (laughs) Movie trivia has never been so much fun. Challenge yourself or have a movie trivia night with friends and family in party mode. Choose from the most popular movie categories, including action, comedy, romance, sci-fi, horror, foreign, general, kids, and 2010 to present. If that's not enough, give the wheel challenge a spin. How well do you know your movie trivia? Uh, I, I know it pretty well, according to this game. Basically, it's uh it is what it says it is. It's it's a trivia game. You'll you can have single player, you can have the party mode with uh up to four players to play it. Uh you start with three lives, at least in the single player. I didn't have a chance to do the party mode. I'm going to assume it's all fairly similar. Uh you start the game, you have three lives, a question pops up, you have four multiple choice answers to it. Uh you know, just basic movie trivia like who is the actor who played uh ron burgundy and it's like steve carell mark Wahlberg, will ferrell chevy chase in the sad part is i would get that very wrong so it's what's your answer it would be steve carell obviously wrong Wrong. (laughs) but that doesn't mean that you lost the question that just halves the points and you get one more shot oh so they let you so they let you kind of drill down to like all but the last answer and eventually you can get it but you'll just get lost like less points no, for you, each you get you get one wrong guess and then if you get it the second time you get half the points if you miss it the second time you lose a life once all three lives are gone game over oh so it's a high score push <clears throat> pressure lucky or just push through pretty much uh just compete to see how high of a score you could get uh it makes me sad that this is part of the creators club but I'll get to those gripes in a little bit. Uh, party mode has up to the four players. Category mode lets you pick one of any of the different movie categories to pick from and just play X number of questions solely in that category. And then they have the wheel mode where it spins a magical wheel. It gives you a random category and you get 10 questions from that category. Beat three wheel spin challenges and you win the game. I kind of wish that the lives would replenish in between categories in the wheel mode, but oh well, I guess it, you know, it doesn't want to make it too easy for you since you're only going to get 30 total questions. Uh, and it seemed to me at least like the easier questions were worth more points than the harder ones. I don't know if that was an intentional thing so that like if a question is too hard, you're not like, oh, well, I'm losing a shitload of points with this. Well, the question I would have in regards to that thing is like when you gauge difficult to easy questions, was it based on like just personal knowledge of the question or was it like a question having a more complicated answer to it? I I think it, it would just be like more topical stuff. Like the, the question I mentioned earlier uh, about Ron Burgundy was worth like a thousand points. And then there was a question of like 1920s, like early early movie history that i'm sure not many people would know at all and i think it was only worth 250 maybe 100 points yeesh and the the other question might that comes to that though it might be one of those things like you might not know because of just how many questions are in the game but you think it's possible that they randomize the point values to the questions so that ron burgundy question if you played and came across it in a future game session could have been a 250 pointer I, I don't know. I only ran ac- across one repeat question and I wasn't taking notes of the point values at that time because I was just, you know, it was still earlier in the game. And 
the one question was in the single player mode and then i got a repeat of it in a category mode so i you know specific uh-huh. i went to the comedy section and i got one specific everything else i haven't had any repeat so i'm going to guess there's a decent number of questions in the game uh some of my gripes with the game i wish there was some form of a splash screen when you start the game you know and you know modern consoles you start a game and it gives you like a static image while it loads the game yeah this Unless was you know a, something's happening. This was a white screen, and it was blinding me. <laughs> so not only do you have a blinding screen, but if you're not familiar with, it, you think the game could be crashing. Yeah, I I was like, is it loading? Is it not loading? What's going? It eventually, you know, the the company logo popped up, and I knew everything was okay. But I'd love to see some kind of splash screen for it. Just anything besides a pure white screen, so I don't think something broke. <laughs> and then i don't know if this is an issue with the game or if it's an issue with the creator program like games in the xbox creator program but there were no d-pad controls so only analog yes and in a game where you have to choose you know up down left and right between four answers you kind of want a more precise you know digital input than analog I concur. Not to mention that analog really brings nothing to the table there. Like, yes. the, why is it there? I, I want to say I played one other game in the preview or in the not preview in the creator program that had another issue where like D pad controls would not work. And I don't know if this is an issue with the creator program or, or what's going on, but D pad control should not be ignored, especially in games like this. And then my other gripe with it is I wish this was an ID at Xbox game instead of the creator collection. My biggest gripe, and this isn't a direct knock to the game, it's a knock to the creator collection, is that they don't have any kind of internet activity, which means there's no online leaderboards. Uh, no online multiplayer. And no achievements at all, which even a game like this, at a dollar, it's fun, it's a cool trivia game, lots of lots of good questions in there, some stuff that had me stumped. At, even at a dollar, it's so many gamers out there are just not going to care because there's no achievements. Which is a rough thing, and you think yeah. about it, I want to be like, nah, that's not a big a deal, but then I realized, once I started doing more with my Switch, just how dependent, quote unquote, I had become on achievements and trophies to mark progress. Yeah. It's such an odd concept when you think about it. when they first announced achievements in games. I thought it was the stupidest damn thing ever. I'm like, why can't I just tell my friends how well I did? And then I learned to like appreciate them in the sense of saying, hey, now you don't have to think I'm lying because I can just point to my achievement and show you what I did. Yeah. But now I'm just like, I can't get numbers to show up on my game. This is achievements have changed the way people play games. It, they really have. They did. And for example, this has nothing to do with the trivia game. Uh, NBA uh, 2K18 came out recently. Everyone knows NBA 2K. Every year a game comes out. They released a prelude, a free to download, kind of like a, a mini lead up demo kind of thing. They did uh-huh. it in, for 2K17 as well, where you could play through like the life of a, a high school kid. You play his final game and then you go to college, you play a game or two. Then you get drafted, and then it's like, and now the game begins. The 2K17 (laughs) version had achievements, and they had PlayStation trophies. 2K18 had PlayStation trophies, no Xbox achievements, and nearly everybody I know, interested in 2K18 or not, did not give a shit about the prelude. Oh, they ignored the prelude because, like, without the achievements, I'll just wait for the game to come out. Yeah, they, they saw no reason to do it, like achievements as goofy as they may sound and even me i used to be an achievement whore i'm not an achievement whore anymore but they still matter to me and to many people to play a game and again this isn't a knock on trivia challenge because it's it's a knock on the xbox creator collection program they should at least give them the option to put trophies in if they want to yeah do do it like the arcade games on 360 where they have a limit of 200 or 400 or whatever you want i can from what I hear, I've heard rumblings that Microsoft has enacted like a minimum $5 price tag to have achievements in games. Oh, which means that the Creator Club could have them. Just you got to hit that $5 price tag. No, point. no. The Creator Club doesn't get them at all. Oh, period. Yeah. Eesh. And, I, and from what, you know, in my opinion, I would rather pay 5 bucks for a game like this and get achievements out of it and have online leaderboards 
than to pay a dollar and get nothing. That is true. But as it stands, the game itself for only a dollar, I think it's worth picking up. There's a lot of cool questions in there. It's it's not going to be something that you're going to sit and play for hours at a time. But it'd be fun for, you know, party night, which is what trivia games are for. Just get a bunch of friends together and go through a bunch of trivia questions and kill some time. It's only a buck, so it, it could also qualify as a fuck it, why not? But I would love to see games like this get the full ID at Xbox treatment and become a full real game like Pinocchio, be a real boy. Because the... <laughs> The creator collection, despite how good some of the games can be, and I'm sure there's a lot of garbage in there too, like the the indie section on the 360 where fucking 400 vibrating games, they're just yeah. not going to get the attention that they deserve being stuck in that program. That is true because I only used to try, I used to only you know brave that wasteland when someone recommended a game specifically to me. Yeah, if I didn't know it existed, I was not going to get it. Yeah, the the. Xbox Live Indie Game Store was just such a wasteland of shit with a few hidden gems hidden in there. And thankfully, the Creator Collection isn't like that yet, but I worry that it will be. Because, you know, I, I don't think I've seen a game over $4 in there yet. Well, is, is it? I'm not sure how it's working, but is there somebody actually, you know, determining if a game qualifies? Or are you just saying, hey, you want to be in here? Pay the licensing fee and you're good to go. I have no idea how it works. uh uh-huh. We're all in the same boat, folks. <laughs> all, all I know is, again, personal preference. I would rather pay a couple more bucks, get a fully featured game with online leaderboards or even online play, although that's, that might be asking for a lot from single-person development teams, and to have achievements than to just, I don't know, they feel like an afterthought compared to other games out there. Yeah, which is very much unfortunate. Yeah, but anyway, uh, next game and the last game you're here to talk about is called Splunker Party, developed by Tozai Games, published by Square Enix. It released October 19th on the Switch and on Steam for $29.99. One night, a great rumbling sound awoke Splunkette with a fright. A comet hit, hit the Earth, and strange things have been happening ever since. The fairy chief said that they were caused from something deep underground. What lies in its depths? Splunkett hurried off base camp, excited for an adventure. Purnell, how was your Splunkin? Splunk? <laughs> I can't even do it. Splunk, Splunkerific. <laughs> Splunker Party is a game that I, I am pretty sure would be very divisive for people. Um, I think the before- Splunker series as a whole is very divisive because... For people who don't know, Splunker was an NES game where your character was the biggest weenie in the world and that if he fell like half of his body distance, it, he was dead. And they bring, they maintain that spirit wholeheartedly because mm-hmm. you're still a wuss in every sense of the word. So, and it takes getting used to as well because when you, when you first start playing the game, you're going to try to like do like typical video game shortcut jumps. Like I'm going to just jump and kind of fall a little bit, knowing I'm going to eventually grab the vine as I move towards it. But no, the game will stop you mid descent and <laughs> descend and kill you because you fell at half an inch. It doesn't so, even let you fall to the ground and die. It's just like you fell too far. You die in midair. You die in midair. And it pisses you off at first, but you eventually get used to it because it's one of those scenarios where it's like, rather than complain about what the that the game isn't what you want it to be, play the game as designed and see if you can enjoy it like that. Because sometimes that's, that's how it works, you know. I mean, not every game gets that courtesy, but some games do. And when I got over that and was like, I'm just going to play the game, knowing that I got to make the jump and grab the vine here, not not shortcut hop it. I was enjoying the game honestly. The way it's designed is that every level, and there's a lot of damn levels. I mean, a lot. Um, every level is designed where it's like a small labyrinth of sorts, and you are trudging through it, trying to locate various treasures, whether it's piles of money or artifact lithograph stones. And at each section of the game, you have a, a specific energy meter. And when the energy meter wipes out, you die. So your goal is to get from point A to point B, then C, D, E, F, whatever. Which, and each time you get to one of those different points, you'll get either an oxygen boost or you'll move on to another exhibi- an exhibition zone. So the first exhibition zone might say, for example, I have like two or three waypoints. And each time you get to a waypoint, who oxygen re- energy refills. So I can keep exploring the dungeon and you can kind of keep going back if you need to to regenerate. 
And once you get to the end of an exhibition zone, you stop on a platform weight, and this requires the number of people playing the game at the time to press it down, which allows you to proceed to the next section of the dungeon. So there's the obstacle types. There are a number of things. Breakaway floors. You might have weird, like, mangrove plant monsters. You might have, like, weird... Like, there's, like, a lot of different things that are ultimately trying to stop you. Steam vents and pooping bats, amongst other things. And the way the game is designed is that any of those things can kill you, but you are mitigating some of it by way of equipment that you can find in the game. How do you get equipment? Multiple ways. One is by going into a level and picking up the lithographs that are hidden within each stage, which can be found either just on the ground or behind walls that you have to blow up with a bomb. And when you find enough lithographs, you'll complete a picture of the item and you'll unlock it. And it provides you with a different ability, which such as, you know, blocking guano from bats or resisting steam or fire damage one to two or three times. And you can increase the effect of the item by leveling it up. If you cannot tell, this was definitely modified from a mobile game. But in this case, it was not a bad thing. Because since you're not paying the mobile add-on costs and stuff, it's just one more dungeon romp to level something up. And that's kind of fun to me. <laughs> so local, but well, here's my one of my only real gripes about the game, which is very unfortunate. And that is the fact that you cannot get everything unless you play multiplayer. To some, that's a blessing in disguise. That's awesome. I get to play games I like with my friends. But here's the hurdle with this game. One, there's got to be that hope for the online community because the online community at present is not that strong. I ask it, as you know, you know, Jill, I don't do online with randos ever. Yeah. Ever. But for this game, I made an exception because I wanted cool shit. <laughs> so I booted up the game. I went online. There was like maybe three Japanese players that I was seeing back like here and there to join games with. And that was all I could play with. And when you got online with those guys, there was no voice chat. It was just a bunch of icons that you could select. So like over here or wait or thank you. And depending on who you play with, they could either be well good at the game to the point where they're just wanting you to chase after them because they already want to beat the stages, or they're dumb as a box of rocks and they can't get the hint to stand on the damn ledge to hold a switch down so you can get the stone that's on the corner they can see on the damn screen, which happened way often more often than I wanted to. The guy is like, oh, I'm just going to fight. He's like, no, I just did the wait icon. Keep your ass here. He's like, nope, I'm going to follow you for a bit. Yeah, be stupid. But, um... So that ends up becoming quite the challenge, which means you'll probably want to try to get some friends either to play it locally or buy the game and play it multiplayer with you over the interwebs. So you have a guaranteed person that you know you're speaking to, that you know is playing the game. You set up a Discord chat or something and chat with them while you play. Um, but the other downside to the multiplayer part of it, and I'm not sure why they did this, though I guess I kind of have a small idea. Online multiplayer. If you play online together, you can all level up your gear. So when you beat the stage, there's like an MVP award. You can distribute nice awards, which I'm not sure what they do per se. And everybody's equipment levels up. But in local multiplayer, only player one's equipment gets a gets experience points for beating a stage. So other players can't level up gear. They have to use your scraps, hmm. which I, is a, a kind of an annoying, <clears throat> rather annoying design choice on their part. I mean, I'm sure they can answer that, but I thought that was a kind of almost kind of punishing people who play locally. Um, and then in addition to that, I forgot to mention the other way to get equipment. There's um, eventually you find a set of animals or a specific pooch animal. And what pooch does is you can pay the money that you find in the dungeons to send him on errands to try to dig up items that are specific to certain maps. So you'll unlock a number of like five to seven maps. I can't remember the exact total that exists in the game. And you can say, pay $5,000 to send pooch to this place, and he'll bring back one cool item, which can be either normal, was it in rare, like level of rarity from normal to rare to like super rare, basically. And the rarity determines how many levels it can take on. So like, like three levels, or five levels, or ten levels. I don't know what the middle term one is because I've never got a middle ground. It's always been I've only worked with low and high. So you have to worry about that. And again, that's another sign of it originally being a mobile game because you're going to be journeying up a lot of cash to get the money to send the dog on runs to get items for you because it takes a lot of money to send them on those adventures. So, But again, there's a lot of maps to play too. I mean, because you can go down to like each world by just going down like a specific path to get to the final boss and beat him and move to the next world. But in addition to the stages to get to the boss, there are other many or like other stages scattered all over the main map 
which probably doubles or even triples the size of the stage. There is a lot of game time here. There's a lot to do. Um, the only hurt, again, the only last hurt I can think of that somebody might have an issue with is sameness, which is that you might be like, oh, I've done this before. The mechanics are, I've been there, done that, whatever. But at the same time, I think we can agree that Spelunker, the original game, was a Nintendo sort of arcade stylish game. <laughs> which means it had a very formulaic gameplay style, just like if you were to say you played Final Fight. What did you do? Went through five stages and you did the same thing the whole time. Punched and kicked guys. Hell, you didn't even kick unless you jumped. Um, but you pretty much did the very same basic thing through five stages. And you got it and you liked it. This is just an expanded form of an old style of game. So, yeah, you're doing all you're doing is hopping, climbing, bombing, and occasionally blowing ghosts and steam away. Though I got to admit, they did a lot of pretty clever stuff with the limited arsenal they give you. Um, but... You were there for that, and you just want more levels that let you do it in different ways. Yeah. So play for a bit, put it down, come back. Play for a bit, put it down, come back, and you just constantly have streams of new content to keep you busy. So I honestly had fun with it, and I was surprised when I talked to a friend of mine. I was like, yeah, I'm reviewing this game, Spelunker Party. And he was like, well, I heard that game is bad. I'm like, who told you that? <laughs> like, well, like the, the internet did. I'm like, well, <laughs> I can't speak for the internet. I mean, it's a big place, but... I've been enjoying the game, and I'm not going to lie to somebody either. I was having genuine fun playing this game. I, I, I think Splunker has a, a very mixed reputation because of the NES game, and I've been trying to look up. I know you're, you're making mention that Splunker Party may have been a mobile game. I'm not seeing anywhere that it was, so it might just have like mobile elements to it. Uh, that's possible. I thought I read somewhere that it was a mobile game originally, and I, then it got converted to Steam and Switch. It's but possible. I know I know there's a game called Everyday Splunker on mobile, but that seems like just a straight remake of the original with some new features to it. I know there was also a PS3 game of, of some form of Splunker format. I don't remember what it was. So it's it's been around the block and it's very interesting. And <laughs> I'm about might- to look into it, but I'm going to bet that if I'm still right about it being originally a mobile game, they probably changed the name of it. Possible the, the console releases because they wanted to make it more of a party game, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> rebranding, sell it. Um, but I am curious. But even if it was or wasn't, I can say that it's the same issue I have with a lot of like, you think about mobile games compared to console games. There's a lot of meth, there's a lot of mechanics that would exist in mobile games that are annoying. But if they're in a console game where you don't have to pay for every attempt with money, they don't hurt so much. They're actually fun. Because, hey, they're grinding, and people like to grind sometimes. It makes the game, you want to build up your equipment, level up your people, yeah. you know, get stronger tools. So many games do it. It's the Skinner box. We've been, com- we've been conditioned to like it. Indeed. Um, so the fact that it is free, as a, well, not free, but you know what I mean, all paid up at the cost of admission, that makes it more enjoyable to me. I want new equipment. I want to level it up. And I want to find new stuff and keep jumping into the wheel and going through that perch. And I like the idea of being able to play through dungeons with friends and unlocking different equipment items that I couldn't get alone. Nice. So I guess the only question left, 30 bucks. What is your verdict on Splunker Party? I got to go with a try. And because of the fact that, again, like we talked about earlier, the weird hopping stuff that some people might have issues with, like, oh, my God, I play like this old clunky game. But the reality is that's how the game is designed to be played. Mm-hmm. It's not a design flaw. It's how it's meant to be played. So you adapt to it and get used to it. But if it's not something you think you can do, Try playing it on like a like a demo or something. I know there's a demo on the Switch. There may be a demo on Steam. Um, if, if 80s games scare you, stay away. <laughs> yep, exactly. But if 80s games are intriguing to you, but you're on the fence, download that demo and give it a go. But I think that if you can play the demo and feel that there's you want to do more stages, you want to get more equipment and press onward, they give you thirty dollars worth of material in the game easily. Sounds you just have good. to want to play it. Sounds good. Well, Purnell, thank you so much for joining and uh, talking about these games with me. Uh, I know you'll be back on soon. Do you have any final thoughts? Stay warm, people. We're going into the, we're going into the danger zone now. There's no turning back. It's cold. I don't like it. And clearly, when I'm on your show, I always talk about the weather. I don't know what it is, but I'm just conditioned to it. All right, moving on. Next person joining the show, Tom Miller. How are you doing today, sir? Oh, things are going all right over here. No fires? Things good? Oh, yeah. I have to check uh, in, like, every time with you anymore. (laughs) (laughs) 
It's a fire-free zone. Now it's so damp, there will never be any fires for the next many, many months. I don't know, man. People say that all the time, and then, like, two days later. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I had a false sense of security before the last one happened, so. I mean, it's it's raining here, and I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if something just, like, exploded the way, the way my luck has been lately. I'm just waiting for, like, my window to catch fire somehow. But it's yeah, glass. Well, it doesn't burn. Well, yeah, it's my luck. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's the first time for everything. Yeah, seriously, man. I, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you're here to talk about two games, and the first one is called Riskers, developed by Shot X Studio, published by M4. It released October 7th on Steam for $9.99. What would you do if you found a briefcase filled with money? Garbage Man Rick chooses to keep the money for himself and becomes the target of powerful and dangerous mobsters in the process. Think you have what it takes to survive? Tom, did you survive? Ah, uh, no, but, you know, <laughs> uh, well, I, I did sometimes, yes. Uh, so, yeah, Riskers is, uh, from what I can tell, the first game that the studio has has developed. And for a first game that you make to be like a GTA-style sandbox game, it's like super ambitious, and I got to respect that. <laughs> um, but, yeah, that's what it is. Uh, so you've got... It, it is sort of reminiscent of the early Grand Theft Auto games where you have a top-down view. Uh, you can walk or drive around the city, steal cars at will, uh, and, you know, you get the attention of cops, obviously, when you do that. And, you know, you have to kind of get around the city and stuff. Um, but uh, it has also, uh, when you get into missions, it has almost more of a Hotline Miami-style uh, uh, shooting uh, section to it. So... You have like a top down view and you have, uh, you pick up different weapons and you can, uh, sort of get around the area and you try to shoot everybody in the room. Um, so it's a, it's a nice mix of action and the sort of sandboxy thing where you're looking, uh, you're looking around the city and, and trying to find some, uh, you know, uh, different missions and you got, uh, you know, different shops and NPCs and stuff. Uh, and one of the things that I really liked about this game, uh, there are some really nice looking, uh, like, uh, uh, graphic novel style cutscenes. Um, it's, it's done. I haven't actually played Max Payne, but I've seen a little bit of it and it sort of reminds me of how, uh, that game is done where everything is done in a really like noir graphic novel style and they have, Everything is very stylized. Uh, they were really well done and detailed, and uh, it was one of the highlights for me. Um, the so, th the so this is yeah. like a, a sandbox style game, open world style game. Well, it sort of is. It's on a much smaller scale than a lot of games in that style, but it does have like some free roaming. Nice, because I'm looking at screenshots, and I I really dig the the GTA old school GTA and Hotline Miami style mashup vibe it's got going on. And apologies yeah. for uh, whatever noise that was a, a couple of seconds ago. The cat jumped on my desk and hit my mic stand with its tail and hit one oh. of the springs on it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so I don't know how loud that picked up by the mic. <laughs> well, I didn't hear it, but uh, it'll, it'll probably be a massive crash on the final recording. I can't wait. I can't wait. All of this <laughs> audio is unusable right here. <laughs> it yeah. stopped like a minute ago, but it's still just ruined. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Um, yeah, so there are some downsides to it. It does right now only have mouse and keyboard controls, which is kind of a bummer because, like, it would benefit so much. And uh, the developer has said, like, they had it going, but it wasn't working. So I really, really do hope they figure it out because it would be about a thousand times more fun to play with the controller. <laughs> oh, no. This went this went from like on my radar to maybe not because I hate mouse and keyboard controls. I, know I just do. I can't do it. I just can't. Um, but you know, I mean, chances are, I mean, this game is getting patched all the time. It just came out, so hopefully they're they're working on that. And uh, the actual city part, um, the city itself just kind of looks a little samey. Like uh, when you're driving around, there's kind of like. Not really a whole lot to differentiate parts of the city from one another, so I just kind of end up with my eye on the overhead map the whole time. <laughs> um, which, you know, I mean, it, it gets the job done, but it just feels a little bland sometimes. Um, but definitely, like, in the action sections of the game, especially, uh, 
it's really fast paced. It has almost like a stealth element to it because if enemies see you, they just like immediately start firing at you. So it's kind of, uh, it's fun to, uh, you really do have to plan out your strategy when you go into a room because, uh, you know, you, you have to really kind of wind your way around the different areas and figure out how you're going to do it. Um, because you die like immediately when you get hit. There's, there's very little, like if you're in enemy's sights and, and you're in their range, like you're probably not going to make it out of there. So it does bring a new, uh, strategic element into it, which I think is pretty cool. So it's like the hotline Miami one shot. You're dead. Yeah. Gotcha. So, uh, overall 10 bucks. What are your thoughts on this one? Yeah. I think that if you are like looking for a, uh, like that kind of a shooter, a very like, uh, kind of like technically demanding but also sort of open-ended game it might be worth checking out uh to me i personally probably wouldn't have gotten it just because uh i don't know it just it has a little bit of uh it's just kind of lacking polish in a lot of places Mm. but it definitely does have some fun stuff in it and uh the art style for for the cutscenes is really really cool um so there is a lot to recommend for it for sure Nice. I'm going to cross my fingers personally that this comes to console or at the bare minimum gets controller support. Yeah. I, I think it looks pretty cool, but I just I'm not doing mouse and keyboard. I can't do it, man. Yeah, can't fucking do it. Uh, Speaking of crazy controls, I'm going to do one quick. A game called Maria the Witch developed and published by Naps Team. It released October 31st on Xbox One for four ninety nine. Zaki and Mia stole all the males and spread them all over the world. Help Maria to bring them back to their owners. She's an amateur and she still needs a lot of practice to master her broom. It will not be easy, but she has to do what she has to do. Uh, as you can tell, this is about a witch named Maria who has to collect mail and return it to the world. It's a, a cute game. It's like a 2D, uh, I want to say a, a, platformer style game but it's all done on a broom and you're flying uh it's it's a very tough game to explain in words and it's something that you have to like get your hands on to truly understand the controls of the game yeah but the controls are very 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 hard to get the hang of and make the game a lot more difficult and unfun than it should be basically how it works is on the xbox controller let me get it so i could double check on all the buttons here uh X and B are the two buttons that you're going to use. And if you hold B, you will move to the right, but like in a circle, if that makes sense, like you hold B huh. and, and you're heading to the right. It's like, imagine you're sitting on a broom and yeah. all the acceleration is just done at the very, very back of the broom. So if you hold oh. the acceleration down, it just like spins in a circle the whole time. Oh, okay. So it's like a, uh, sort of like a chopper challenge kind of thing. I haven't played Chopper Challenge. So. Or just like when you hold the button down, you you your your upward velocity, like you both go up and forward. Yeah. Okay. So the the, the way that you have to control it is you pretty much have to tap the B button so that you get some of the thrust, but you're not holding it down to change the direction you're moving. Like, if you hold the button, it'll turn you up and then upside down and then, you know, facing down. It just spins you basically clockwise and counterclockwise. And if you just tap the button, it gives you that thrust, but without the rotation. Like Hmm. I said, the the controls are very difficult to get the hang of. So trying to explain them is even more fun. (laughs) Yeah, I think I got what you're talking about. But... You know, otherwise, this is such a cute and enjoyable game. It's, you know, you go through the stages, you'll have to navigate some narrow passageways and avoid enemies and collect coins in the stages and collect letters that you deposit into a mailbox. And the whole goal is to earn three stars in each level, if you can, and move on. There's one for beating the stage, one for collecting all of the mail in a stage, and one for beating a stage without dying. Which, with the controls in this game, good luck. <laughs> there's there's only a handful of stages that I've actually been able to get through without any deaths at all. And, like, the game doesn't make it easy on you to get through without dying, but things get even more complex with how the checkpoints in the game work. Hmm. Each stage could have, you know, anywhere from, like, three to, like, eight checkpoints. And when you reach a checkpoint, you have to pay a coin to unlock the checkpoint so you can continue from there. 
Otherwise, you get reset back to where the previous paid checkpoint is. Unfortunately, there aren't enough coins to actually cover all of the checkpoints. Oh. And I didn't realize that the first time I played it. Oh, no. So as I was getting coins, I'm like, well, another checkpoint. Let's do this. Like, wow, there's there's not enough coins in this stage. Oh, well, I'm sure next stage will make up for it. And next stage, there's even less coins and even more checkpoints. And I I would get to sections in the game where I'm just like, I can't make it through this. Huh. And then through the next couple of sections in the hopes of finding a coin to pay for a checkpoint. So I would like. I would try moving to other stages and get a coin just to jump back a couple of stages and pay for a checkpoint there. But now in these future stages, like I have automatically fucked myself because I don't have enough coins. When you get to the stages where you're really getting screwed over, (laughs) you're dying constantly. And and from what I could see, there's no way to refund a checkpoint. So if Hmm. you don't stockpile your coins for difficult areas and you don't plan ahead, you could just you know, paint yourself into a corner and you have nowhere to go and nothing to do. And you're just stuck with these hard sections complicated by the controls. And, you know, some of these sections, they have very, very narrow passageways with, and with the unforgiving controls, it just, there, there was one section of the game. I, I tried like 60 sometimes before I finally hit the one section. Well, it's, it is, it is, tough man and for yeah, something exactly. aimed at you know visually and uh content wise it seems very much aimed towards a younger audience oh and yeah i'm looking at pictures right now and it looks like uh like kiki's delivery service or something uh it i really do like the art style yeah it's it's a cute game and it's a fun concept but the controls in this game are the one thing that are just holding it back i could appreciate that they wanted to do something different with the game and not just you know you fly along using the analog stick i'd rather see standard like traditional controls in this game give yeah. me an, give me an accelerate give me a brake button let me change direction with the analog stick but the control scheme that they have in the game it's just it makes the game so much more unfun than it should be at five bucks you know i could still give it a a a little bit of a recommendation because it is a fun game. It is a cute game. And if, if you can get a hang of the controls, it is an enjoyable game, but for the majority of the people, I think the controls and the difficulty are just going to be too much to overcome. But, uh, like I said, if you can get the hang of it, there's, there's fun to be found. I just, I hope that the devs hear this and implement some other kind of alternate control scheme or, you know, add more coins, make it so you don't have to pay for the checkpoints, do something to make it a bit more forgiving and a bit more accessible for everyone, especially younger gamers, man. They're they're going to struggle with this. Yeah. But yeah, uh final game to talk about that you're here for is called mm. Figment, developed and published by Bedtime Digital Games, it released September 22nd on Steam for 19.99. Figment is an action adventure game that invite <clears throat> uh, Yeah, what the hell is that? <laughs> thanks throat figment is an action adventure game that invites you to explore a unique surreal universe filled with music humor and multi-layered narrative join dusty and his ever optimistic friend piper on an adventure through the different sides of the mind seeking to restore the courage that's been lost tom what does that mean so this is a really cool game and uh it was kind of one of the ones that like I saw it and immediately knew that I wanted to play it. So Bedtime uh this is the same studio that made uh Back to Bed uh which is still on my list of shame. I haven't gotten around to it in the last <laughs> couple of weeks here. Uh but Figment uh, like you said uh, it's an action adventure game. Uh it's got uh some isometric graphics uh sort of a similar perspective to Bastion or uh you know, games like that, if you've just going to uh, say it reminds me a lot of Bastion looking at it. Yeah, it just uh, with how, uh, you know, just how alive everything looks like the graphics and the art style are just amazing in this game. It has like, um, I guess whimsical would be the word that I would use. They have like a lot of objects made out of like pencils and teacups and, you know, all kinds of things. And uh, so you're uh, you're going through the brain of somebody who's been in uh, in an accident and trying to uh, trying to restore you know the different parts of it. So you you travel along 
and you see, you know, you, you go through like the right brain, left brain, different, uh, as uh, different parts of the brain control, different like creativity or, you know, logic or whatever. And, uh, so, but <laughs> it, it plays, uh, like a pretty simple, like the combat actually is pretty simple. You just have like a regular attack and a charge attack. Uh, mm-hmm. but, uh, it focuses a lot more on the exploration and just the world building part of it. And, uh, the world itself is beautiful. And also it has a great sense of humor to it. Um, there, uh, just like everything in this game is, has so much like just care put into it, both the animation and, uh, the music, uh, the score changes so much depending on where you are. Uh, the instrumentation changes and like, you'll just, you'll get close to a house and, there will be like a specific theme for that house. And, uh, you have like, there, there are these like bird houses that when you get close to them, they have like this funky little jam that starts up. It's a bird house jam. Uh, so the, the soundtrack, the graphics, the world are all excellent. Um, uh, the actual gameplay, um, so it kind of goes back and forth between action sections and puzzle sections. Um, you have, uh, the puzzles are sometimes well they ramp up as you get further into the game they they do have some pretty uh some of them do kind of blend into each other they just have like find the battery that corresponds to a certain node and then you know it's kind of like shuffling objects around to get to the next area uh, but there are some really creative ones too um so and so the combat itself like i mentioned it's pretty simple like uh, sort of zelda style combat Um, but the way that they, uh, execute it is really cool because, uh, the music, um, the music changes to, uh, to suit the combat, but like the bosses, the, the bigger enemies that you fight actually sing to you as the fight is going on. It has like this musical element to it and they're like taunting you through song as they attack you. (laughs) Like I've never seen a game do that before and it's awesome. I love it. Uh, yeah, there's just so much creativity and so much like just kind of weirdness and I don't know. I just this game is delightful. I'm trying to think of the last enemy that like serenaded me before fighting me, and I, I yeah, like the great mighty Pooh from Conquer. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> I, I can't think of anything else that really sings to you. <laughs> there's a uh, Gato from Chrono Trigger. And, oh yeah, you know? get those silver um, points, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this this game looks stunning too. Yeah, absolutely. So I gotta know for twenty bucks, what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, I'd say it's definitely worth checking out. Um, it is a little bit on the short side. People are, um, you know, usually I'm seeing like four to five hours to to complete the game. Um, uh, but I think it's worth it completely. Um, it just has so much personality to it, and uh. And I don't know, and I didn't even really mention the story, but the way it reveals itself is really cool and uh, and original. And yeah, I would absolutely recommend getting this one. I think for twenty bucks, it's absolutely worth it. Nice, yeah. Four four or five hours, I think, is fine. I would rather spend twenty bucks on a four to five hour game that I'm going to enjoy the entire time. Oh yeah. Than like sixty plus dollars on a you know. 50 60 70 hour game that i'm never going to finish 60 hours of mediocrity yeah. yeah or or even even if it's an incredible game i just i don't have the time for that i i like shorter games four to five hours 20 bucks i like that i'm good yeah with that. i mean more and more for me that's the case as well i uh i dig it and even better uh this will be out on tuesday the 31st so happy halloween everybody uh, the game is on sale for sixteen ninety nine until tomorrow, so you got one day to save three bucks on it. Right on. So, uh, yeah, Tom, thanks so much for joining and covering these games and listening to me talk about Maria the Witch and her controls, which <laughs> I I really hope they fix because it's otherwise a really enjoyable game and it's cute. I like cute, cheap, fun games. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Uh, any any final thoughts to sum everything up? Oh, you know, uh, just, uh, the, the usual. All right. Moving on. Uh, Chris Taylor is here to chat with us about a couple of games. Chris, how are you doing tonight? Doing good. Just got back from a night at the arcade. How'd that go? Pretty good. I beat House of the Dead 4 finally. Ooh. Yeah. It only cost several thousand dollars. Wait, House of the Dead 4? 
Yeah. Is that overkill? No, I think it, no, it's just four. Why don't um, I remember House of the Dead four? Yeah, it's uh, I've been I've been seeing it around lately. It's I think it's on the House of the Dead three and four on the Wii. I think it's the newest number. I don't think there's a House of the Dead five yet, but I'm uh, not sure. Okay. I think I but, think you know. I think my brain was mixing up uh, House of the Dead three and four with House of the Dead two and three. My my brain just not working. Oh, maybe it is two and three actually. Now that I think about it, uh, I don't know. It's uh, apparently on PlayStation, so. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. It's it's actually House of the Dead two and three. That's um. So four is not in there. House of the Dead four is on PS three and arcade. So that's interesting. Two thousand five. Where the fuck have I been for the past twelve uh, years? <laughs> I know. Oh my god. Well, you don't have any House of the Dead to talk about tonight, but uh, nope. you are here to talk about a couple of games. Let's start off with Count Lucanor, I hope I'm saying it right, developed uh, by Baroque Decay and Rattalika Games, published by Merge Games that released October 18th on the Switch for fourteen ninety nine. dollars Join Hans in a fantasy world and experience a unique adventure full of surprises and challenges. Get hooked on an immersive tale where every decision counts and every clue is a piece to solve the puzzle and get the treasure. Unravel the sordid secrets of the castle, meet colorful characters, and remember, horror always lurks beneath the surface. <laughs> Ooh, Chris, what is this game? Uh, that summary is a better better written review than I have. <laughs> <laughs> Nightmare terrors lurk under every surface. <laughs> 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 Okay, so like Count of Lucinor, uh, I think Count Lucinor, something like that. What is it? The Count Lucinor. It's uh, it's it's how they put it. It's the adventures of a ten-year-old boy who, on his tenth birthday, um, is so dirt poor that like his mom can't even afford like any presents or anything like that. So he's like, I'm gonna go um on an adventure and seek my fortune because there's nothing happening here. Peace out, mom. And she's like, well, you better take these three candles and three gold pieces and one piece of cheese. It's all I have. <laughs> <laughs> it's really depressing. And so, uh, you kind of, you kind of just walk around and interact with things. There's no real battle element. And as far as I could tell, I only played, um, through like sort of, um, the first few, like, I don't know what you would call them areas. I don't know. Enough to get the story going for sure. Um, and you come across a goat herder who, you know, has his little herd of goats and stuff. And he's like, oh, I'm so hungry. And like, you basically do things for people, which involve like losing all of the stuff that you got, like at the beginning of the game, mm -hmm. which makes you feel even poorer. And the last thing that you do is, you know, give the goat herder your, your piece of cheese uh, to eat. And he's got a bottle of wine. So he, <laughs> Let's this 10 year old kid drink this bottle of wine, whereupon the kid passes out and then wakes up in this sort of nightmare alternate reality, um, which actually has a pretty shocking scene, like right at the beginning of it. And uh, you find out that goats are actually vicious monsters that will chase you and kill you and you can't do anything about it. So you just have to run away from them. And eventually, mm -hmm, and eventually you run into this castle where earlier you had seen a pink haired sort of. Uh, teenage girl looking type person like um painting like spray painting graffiti on it like this weird um i don't know what you would call it like a looks like a symbol sort of thing well fred he's trying to eat the cable on this uh on this router sorry hang on a second <laughs> i don't know you can edit that part out i guess <laughs> i'll try we'll see <laughs> or whatever yeah whatever the cat interrupted the show what what else is new <laughs> Okay, so this lady um, is defacing a wall when you meet her, and she runs away. And then when you're in the nightmare reality, that uh, the spot where she had painted is now a hole, and you go inside the castle. And inside, a kobold, or winged demon sort of thing, um, basically says, Oh, we're looking for a noble kid to, uh, to meet the Count Lucinor and become his heir. And the, the kid, remember, he's 10 years old, he's like, so if I'm uh, if I'm a noble kid, then all I have to do is meet this guy and he'll give me all his money. And he's like, yeah, that's basically the point. And the kid's like, all right, cool, I'll do it. And um, so then you have to solve the puzzle of um, 
for like I said, the first part of the game is um, solving the puzzle of what the name of the demon guy is. So you have to collect all the letters of his name and then you know put them in the right order and, in order to proceed. So I got about like half of those letters and such, and they involve finding different colored keys for different colored doors, um, solving. Um, traps and things like that and you even though you don't fight you do take damage and if you take damage you have to eat and if you don't eat then you wind up dying and thus you know um you wind up at the the one safe point which is a uh which is a wishing fountain that's right in the middle of the castle and here's where i had one bit of a of a hiccup and or at least where i thought that the thing was pretty interesting um those gold, those three gold coins that your mom gives you at the beginning of the game, like you end up giving two of them away um, in the story, but then you, with your last one, that's where you, um, you drop it into the fountain in order to save. And anytime you want to save the game, you have to have collected another coin and thrown it in that fountain. So it's a pay to save game, which is real Interesting. rare. Interesting. Yeah, like I haven't seen that since um, I want to say Lunar Two on the Sega CD, where you actually have to give something in order to save your progress otherwise you just every time you die you have to do all the puzzles over again funny enough i was actually uh just before you came on i was talking with tom about the one game maria the witch which just came out on xbox one and the yeah. checkpoints in that game you have to pay a gold coin to use the checkpoints and one of my gripes huh. with the game was there were way more checkpoints than there were gold coins and there's no indication of that before you really get into the game yeah, that's how this game kind of felt, and because you need those gold coins, like, to buy stuff to advance the game, so I'm not exactly sure where you're supposed to get um, enough gold coins if there's a finite amount of them, because they certainly don't seem infinite. Hmm. It's not just something you can grind up or anything like that, so it feels like, basically what it feels like is a little, slightly action-oriented um, point-and-click RPG. Um, like I said, with pay to save, which is, is awkward, but I'm sure, um, I'm sure it sorts itself out at some point because, I mean, that, I would hate for this game. This game is quality, for one, actually, uh, and I'm gonna get to that, but, um, I would hate for it to be, like, kind of undone by that system, if indeed no. it is. Cause certainly I gave up after I died, and I was like, I had, uh, I wanna say four or five of the eight letters, and then I died, and then I had one. <laughs> oh man yeah so i was like oh come on so um yes the graphics of this game are an 8-bit throwback i would say probably closest to like a slightly fancier early king's quest game um looks a little bit something like that uh maybe even an nes game um soundtrack's really good but very sparse uh there's long sections of this game with no soundtrack whatsoever but when it does come in it's pretty cool is Definitely. that like an ambiance kind of thing to set the mood? Yes, it, it's gotcha. very much like an ambiance thing. But it, uh, it's funny enough because it's kind of got that, um, it's got a plotty, like sinister synthy sound that actually we just started watching Stranger Things again and that <laughs> reminded me of that. So I was like, well, all right, well, well done being timely. And, uh, and I mean, the story itself is really interesting as far as like a horror tale goes because um, I mean, the the, ta the game is based on the Tales of Count Lucinor, which is uh, apparently the uh, earliest work, one of the earliest works of prose in Castilian Spanish. So kind of like Curse of Castilla, where you've got, uh, you know, some actual Spanish lore sort of thrown in here. So it's kind of got that cool authenticity to it. Nice. So uh, yeah. I, I got to know, 15 bucks, what is your verdict on this game? Because it's a very interesting looking game, but it's something like when I was looking at it, I had no idea what kind of a game it was. And now that you're telling yeah. me it's like a <laughs> point and click adventure RPG, it, it sounds very complex. Yes, um, this one is definitely for the Brainiacs. Um, for sure, it's it's a good game if you want to like really... Um, figure out some like some cool puzzles like it was pretty enthralling like i said the only um the only issue was when i died and wound up back at the start but <laughs> i had enough gold coins i could have gone back and saved it honestly it was my own fault but um oh you fucked up you fucked yeah up, Chris. exactly you i fucked i up. did yes but <clears throat> so i'm not sure how much that experience might detract from the rest but if you're a fan of these like old school 
eight bit looking games that still run in sixty FPS and have you know cool effects and like you know obviously a modern game. Um, yeah, this one's definitely worth a look. It's interesting, and I think that it's worth a shot. Sounds good. Speaking of retro games, uh, you you got two more to talk about. These will be quicker ones since we. Uh, yeah. I know we covered these two games previously on the the Xbox One releases, but you know, re-releases, new platforms, we got to give them some more attention. Elliot Quest, developed by Ansima's Games, published by Play Everywhere Games, released October nineteenth on the Switch for nine ninety nine. Elliot Quest and his adventure RPG where players explore the mysterious Euro Island in search of an ancient demon. With five dungeons to conquer, 16 bosses to defeat, and countless treasures to discover and hidden areas. Well-balanced gameplay, easy to pick up, but challenging to master. Chris, I've always known this game seemed right up your alley. What are your thoughts on it? I think I tried to get you to get it for me back when it got released on the 3DS, actually. (laughs) (laughs) So I was very, very, very excited to play this one. And Um, Yeah, it has met my expectations for sure. Um, It's again, it's a blocky looking 8-bit game um, done up in the style of like early PC games or even NES. I would even venture to say it's a little Atari-esque in some aspects, but it's like I said, it runs way too smoothly to be in that camp. Um, But yes, this is a game that sort of harkens back to one of my favorite NES experiences, which not a whole lot of people share, and that is Zelda 2, The Adventure of Link. Uh, I actually preferred it to the first Zelda, and sometimes even to the third Zelda, so I'm a little bit of a freak in that way. But I just <laughs> love that sort of, the action aspect of it, the running around the outer world, and like going through towns, talking to people, and like, even though the people only had like one weird cryptic sentence to ever say... And some of them just ignored you, which is, you know, transfers over to this game perfectly. <laughs> um, it's a really cool game with extremely good music. And it has a, it has also kind of a, I don't even want to say an ease element, because I don't think ease even has this, like, level of, um, this kind of character advancement. But basically, you gain levels in the game. And uh, through the usual thing of experience points, and you get to choose um, different stats that you that you increase in the game. A lot like Zelda 2, actually, but instead of just attack, uh, defense, and um, magic, like you have uh, how fast you can shoot your arrows. Your only weapon, of course, in this game is a bow and arrow, uh, as far as I can tell. But you know, you can increase your strength, your amount of bows and arrows you can shoot, um, your magic refills, defense, and um, you know, raise your amount of critical hits, and all that stuff is needed because a lot of these, uh, a lot of the challenges in this game, like when I went through the first dungeon, I was thwarted repeatedly until I sort of ventured off into another area and then discovered a shield which could block all these, like, you know, balls of whatever pixel garbage that these uh, <laughs> these things were sending at me. But I gave that I gave that um, that part of the dungeon like about ten tries before I finally went somewhere else. Like it was that it's like. That's what I consider to be a good balance in a game is where you meet a challenge and you feel like you could probably do it uh, with like super skills. But, you know, what it ends up being is that you probably need something else. But yeah. like the whole idea that oh, I could maybe do this. So I always really like that in games. Um, it's a like tough the, one, too. This game didn't really hold your hand that much. It, it kind of like threw you oh, into no. the fire and it got crazy, too. Yeah, like... uh I was streaming it, and one of my friends asked, what's the lore of this game? And I was like, I don't know. It's only just starting <laughs> to tell me, and I've been playing it for an hour. Like, at that point, I was My name's Elliot, and I'm on a quest. That's what I got I, so far. I honestly wasn't even too sure my name was Elliot, because he was talking <laughs> about Kara, and, like, the way the game was, like, it's just text on the screen, so it's him talking to Kara, Kara, whatever. And finally, at one point, after the first level, he's like, I'm Elliot, and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, oh, okay, that's so this is Elliot Quest, not like, you know, because Legend of Zelda is not about Zelda. <laughs> so maybe Elliot Quest isn't about Elliot, but it is. Um, oh, and I found a fantastic uh, Easter egg in this game in the town. There's a painting that's just barely more than just a collection of pixels. But if you really look at it, it's a reference to another game, and it's it's wonderful. So I could tell that there's like a lot of, even though it's a, a really pixely game, it's like... This isn't like Shovel Knight. Like, your guy is, like, made of eight pixels, <laughs> practically. Um, 
but yeah, it's like it's so lovingly crafted that I was like really into this one. And um, I think as far as like the Metroidvania type games that I've played, this one has probably been the most um, consistently like interesting. And of course, it has an overarching overworld map, a lot like Guruman. Mm-hmm. So I was, and of course, like Zelda too. So I was really into like kind of walking around and trying out places until you know I got to a point where I was like, oh, I need a double jump here. So obviously I got to come back here and you know every time I met a challenge I was like excited because I knew that I could get over that area as soon as <laughs> I got the special power I needed which um they they sort of present in both um abilities and items and also spells and so and all the spells are kind of interesting too like I had first one I got was a leafy whirlwind where if you turn into a leafy whirlwind and then hit a uh, a leaf like a brush underbrush kind of thing it just like whips you right across it and then that turns into like its own sort of um interesting jump puzzle and yeah so it's basically your zelda 2 and metroid style um can be pretty tough i played it on normal i didn't play it on easy um it does have an easy mode and it has a hard mode so having played it on normal like i found myself repeatedly um like doing sections over and over again like because it like one weird thing about it is that like everything that hits you takes away one heart. So if you have four hearts, you have four hits, and that includes giant boss monsters or uh, literally just tiny frogs that jump at you. <laughs> like a guy carries around a pot, and the frogs jump out of this pot, and like you have to in your early um, weapon, like in your early weapon strength, you have to like hit that guy like eight times, and while he's sitting there throwing tiny frogs at you. I hated those fucking frogs. <laughs> I know, right? But it's still fun. So I was, uh, I was really into that, and then I'm definitely gonna go back and like try and get as far into this game as possible. Nice. So ten bucks, your verdict? Ten bucks, get it. I mean, you deserve this game if you like. <laughs> if in any way the side of pixels don't like offend you, then go ahead and pick this up. It's an interesting, quirky um, game, and I think it's actually cheaper on the Switch than on the 3DS. But hey, buy it on the 3DS. I almost did. Buy it everywhere. Yeah, I think it was just the fact that I got to play it on the Switch that kept me from um, pulling the trigger <laughs> on the 3DS one. I had to I had to pick between that and River City, uh, the River City Ransom RPG. Mm. So. All right, well, you, you mentioned pixel graphics. Final game to talk about, ditches the pixels for a more polished look. Still has the yeah. old school gameplay, though, with Caveman Warriors developed by Jandusoft, published by Jandusoft, and East Asia Soft. Release September 22nd on Xbox One, PS4, and Steam for $14.99. Uh, physical version is available now on Play Asia, which is why we're covering this one again for $29.99, oh, cool. limited edition. Uh, East, Asia, East Asia Soft has been doing a bunch of these Play Asia limited physical editions for PS4, so make sure to check that out. Jump back in time and free your inner caveman, smash heads in this local cooperative platformer game. Play solo or team up with up to four players inspired by games like New Super Mario, Joe and Mac, Metal Slug, and Trine. Chris, what did you think of Caveman Warriors? Uh, okay, so Caveman Warriors. This one, I'm thrown slightly by the fact that they say New Super Mario Brothers, because New Super Mario Brothers is just Super Mario Brothers. So, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> I don't know. I guess they, they mean the four-player co-op. Um since that's like one of the only other four player co op like platformers they have out there. So no. maybe they mean new Super Mario Brothers Wii. Uh yes, Caveman Warriors. So a little thing about me. Um all throughout my like experience of playing video games and like collecting them and, you know, whatnot, I um I've always seemed to favor caveman games for whatever reason. I think it's because I played Joe and Mac and the uh the weird little, uh, I want to say it's a Taito, no, it's a Data East game called uh, Caveman Games, which is literally the Olympics, but played by cavemen. <laughs> and and a cavewoman. Her name is Crudla. And uh, I think I've actually mentioned them before in another review. So, I don't know, for some reason, it's always been, like, when you know, when you said Caveman Warriors, do you want to play it? I was like, yes. I don't even care what it is. <laughs> I want to play Caveman Games. And sure enough, I put this in there and um, started playing. Um, you know, you have your, well, when you're playing one player, like I did, you have your choice of four different, uh, sorry, two different cave men and two different cave women. Um, each one has their own special weapons and powers and uh, things that 
let you like kind of get to the next area. Like basically, each weapon is all um they'll have like a, a sub ability that helps you get to the next um, area. So for instance, like uh, I think her name is Liliana. She's a kind of your ninja type who also has the project- projectile weapon. She has a pointed stick with a snake attached to it. And you can throw that into certain walls, and then that becomes a platform, and then she can jump up. And then, um, you know, things like that. So the characters in it are really interesting. Um, they've got a really good variety of uh, sort of like ra- some are ranged attacks. Some are more like... Um, like close up and like heavy attacks. And then the one guy who's like the drummer that you probably see on like the cover, at least I saw him on the cover. He's pretty cool because he, uh, he has the ability to throw a dancing monkey at enemies and it causes them to dance in a certain field of range. And, uh, that's really entertaining. So like you can have enemies boogie and then you jump down and I don't know, beat your drums at them to death. (laughs) What's conveyed here. Uh, the graphics are, absolutely gorgeous they're cartoon style um sprites big beautiful sprites with you know really nice lines uh the backgrounds are amazing the music is really really good and not only is it good it varies depending on what character you switch to at the time so if you think about like mario and yoshi style like when you jump on yoshi sudden in super mario world suddenly you've got bongos that are in the background mm-hmm so, like, if you're playing the drummer character, then you hear these drums in the background. If you're playing, um, I think his name is Jack. I'm bad with names. The uh, the other male heavy, um, you get, like, this kind of sort of flat electric guitar sound in the background, like kind of a surf guitar sound. And, uh, by the way, I love his character design because he has, he clearly has a toupee that is a living creature of some kind. So... He's got a green beard and then this green animal on top of his head, uh, just some kind of like small mammal. And, uh, and like when you run fast enough, like the animal starts to come off his head and you can see that he's just totally bald underneath. So again, great character design. Um, the, I really did want to try this as a four player, uh, co-op experience because that really seems to be where this game would shine. Uh, because when you take down bosses, there are giant, like the first boss is this giant screen filling boss that you have to attack certain weak points in a certain, like, you know, basically you attack multiple weak points um, in short order to stun it, and then you can do damage to it. And that would be perfect for, like, a team of players. But I was able to manage it just by myself, so it's definitely not a game that requires four players. But um, yeah, it's basically uh, it's fast action. It does mostly remind me of Joe and Mac. Like I would say, it's kind of just basically a modern Joe and Mac with four players and a little bit more variety in what they can do and how you know how they do it. And um, yeah, I don't know what they're talking about with like the storyline. It's clearly that these pterodactyls snatch up your children at the beginning of the game, and that's what you're going for. <laughs> you're trying to find these pterodactyls. <laughs> So they're talking about busting heads. It's like there's there's motivation there. It's a kidnapping job. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I was very impressed with this one, and especially that it was a actually a successful Kickstarter game too. I know, which is nice to see that a, a game on Kickstarter came out and is good. Yeah, according to the Kickstarter page, they raised eleven thousand two hundred and five dollars for this game to have it come out, and I'm I'm more impressed at that than anything because this game plays like it's it was made by a major player. Nice. So, so so 15 bucks. What's your verdict? 15 bucks. I mean, you like action platforming, a little bit of difficulty, a really good variety of like things you can do to get over like, because you can choose different characters for different tasks and like actually end up taking two roads to the same destination. So I really enjoy that when that happens, uh, because then you can pick a favorite and kind of get over everything in the same way. So, yeah, I mean, if you're a fan of that kind of platforming and you like the caveman aesthetic, go ahead and pick it up. And, I mean, if you're somebody who is um, needing a little bit more variety in your four-player games besides, you know, like the sports stuff or whatever, like for uh, if you have friends that come over and <laughs> play video games with you, then for sure pick this one up because it looks like it's a lot of fun. Sounds good. And a reminder that a physical PS4 version is available on PlayAsia.com. 30 bucks. It includes the game, a 72 page art book, soundtrack, numbered certificate. So a lot of good stuff there. 
dang, I actually kind of want that for myself too. Go do it, uh, man. Yeah. Go do it. Get the, do it yeah, up. go get the go get the physical version so you can take it to a friend's house instead of taking your whole PS4. Indeed. Sounds good. Or, well, or is that how it works? I don't know. Eh, something like that. I don't know. <laughs> how do games anymore? How do games? I don't know. I'm getting too old for this shit. <laughs> Me too. Uh, well, Chris, thank you so much for talking about these games. I know you'll be back soon. Any final thoughts to sum it all up? Um, I just want to say uh, shout outs to me because of how amazing I am that I reviewed three games while Mario Odyssey is out and I have it. So <laughs> the fact that I spent three hours today on my stream playing uh, two of these games instead of playing Mario Odyssey, I want to say that I deserve a pat on the back for that. <laughs> <laughs> How are you enjoying Mario so far, by the way? Ah, oh, so good. It is so good. It really is. Oh my God. I'm so glad they put the T-Rex in the first level. Very true. Like, the first real level, anyway, I guess. Yeah, that, you know. Well, Nintendo's not, not giving me any games to tell you this, but yeah, go out and pick up Mario Odyssey. It's incredible. $60, uh, yeah, final I've... verdict. <laughs> <laughs> $60. I'm glad my girlfriend works at GameStop. And finally tonight, we're going to talk about a couple of Switch games with our good friend Norg. How are you doing tonight, sir? What up? Yo? Yo, I guess. Is it Christmas yet? I'm so ready for Christmas. <laughs> oh my goodness. Just the jingle bells and the snowballs and, and balls in general. Oh my goodness. Just sign me up for more of that, okay? Let's do this i'm so excited all six of my nipples are tingling you know this episode literally releases on halloween right does it really yeah oh so it's spooky (laughs) i still use that as my voicemail sound your crickets i still use that for my voicemails (laughs) i really do (laughs) <laughs> I, I got the so, wrong uh, holiday going here. So so since we're speaking of, of Halloween stuff, let's talk about the spookiest game of the night, uh, Unbox Newbie's Adventure, <laughs> which is not at all a spooky game. Developed by spooky Prospect... <laughs> developed by Prospect Games, published by Merge Games, that released October 12th on the Switch for $29.99. Unbox Newbie's Adventure is a 90s-style 3D platformer about the ultimate postal service self-delivering cardboard boxes. Unbox Newbie's Adventure has giant worlds full of challenges, collectibles, and boxy boss battles. Uh, I enjoyed this one on the Xbox. We had a fun interview with the developers of it. George, what did you think? Well, let me start by saying the game is cute as hell. Like, the, the whole concept of the fact that it's a cardboard box and you roll it all over the, the game world. That the, the idea behind it is just ultra ultra cute um let me get the stuff that i didn't like out of the way first okay we'll go with that um what i'm guessing was a port glitch from previous systems when this when it faded to black like in between cut scenes or in between scenes or whatever um at the very bottom is a row the entire pixel row on the bottom and the entire pixel row up the right never actually fades out. So you get this black screen and then like shiny pixel shit on the bottom and the right side. So I'm guessing that was probably just a glitch on the switch. It probably didn't exist on the other systems. Yeah. I I don't Um, remember seeing something like that. Like it was cropped wrong or something. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it looked like. It looked like it was cropped wrong and it, it, it didn't bother me that much. It just looked, it just looked lazy. Um, the controls were really, really difficult to get used to after a while. Granted, you're rolling a cube, which the con- that in and of itself just, it's a box and it's trying to roll. So m- maybe they're deliberately trying to make the controls difficult. I don't know. Um, the loading times when I first got the game, I actually thought that it crashed because it just sat there and sat there and sat there the the first the first screens letting you know what game you were playing and then the first time that you actually load the game to start playing i mean we're talking commodore 64 bad and after that the load times felt like commodore 64 with fast load cartridge bad so it was slightly better than bad but given that it everything is solid state i i can't fathom 
loading times that long. Like they were almost as no, I take it back. They were the loading times were longer than Disney Infinity on Wii U, which was bad. <laughs> um, there were a lot of really severe frame late rate slowdowns when the camera would pan out and you'd get like a full view of the massive landscape. Like when you're up close, things moved relatively smoothly. But as soon as the camera panned out, it's like, oh, Lord, what is happening here? Um, so that was a bit of a, a shock and a surprise. Having said that, let's move on to the things that I thought were pretty awesome about it. Yeah, because the I, massive. I, I was going to say, I know, I don't remember the loading times being awful on Xbox, mm -hmm. but it might just be long enough that I've played it that I don't remember for sure. I okay. don't, I don't remember any kind of significant frame issues like you ran into. And then the controls, that's going to be a subjective thing because, you know, you're yeah. fucking controlling a box. It's not supposed to move right. like a ball. But like when you're, when you're running and, and you have to jump and you have to, you have a very small platform to land onto. And it's like, okay, run, jump, run, jump. Okay, pull back, pull back. Oh shit. No, don't fall <laughs> on the fuck. And then you have to do it again for like the 20th time. I don't entirely suck at platformers. So I, I don't, I don't like to think that this is a problem that exists between controller and face. It, it was just really difficult to get a handle on. And over time, I found that I was, some of those tasks got a little bit easier, but it never really felt comfortable. Hmm. But the massive landscape was absolutely gorgeous in concept. And I never found it boring just running around and exploring and looking for the next things that I was supposed to be doing. That was fun and it was beautiful. And even when it was chugging down, it was still fun to go exploring and looking for golden tape and all of that, all the shit that went along with that. The music was cool. The music was actually, the music was really good. It, it fit in all of the scenarios extremely well. It wasn't abrasive and it wasn't and it wasn't particularly obviously just background sound some actual thought went into having music for the game so that was fun um and i liked that there were thematic changes as you approached each of the check checkpoint characters that you had to check in with the characters were hilarious like lots of personality in all of the characters that in the very beginning that one box that they all make that mumbly sound but there was the one dude that looked like he had the piece of straw sticking out of his mouth and he mumbled like a total country hick it was just <laughs> i almost peed my pants when i heard that that was great um there are a ton of things to collect in this game if you are a completionist and you love platformers this is your game because you you will spend so much time trying to get through getting all of the stuff that you can get um if you're not a completionist and you also don't like platformers this game is probably utter torture for you <laughs> so that i i would say there's not an awful lot of in between if you're really really into platformers this is probably going to be fun if you can look back if you can look past difficult controls if frame rate occasional frame rate drops don't bother you and you're accustomed to longish load times on a solid state system like there's a couple of glitches in the game but it was still fun to play there's there's no question about it there's a lot of character there's a lot of um passion obviously built into the game and it 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 was still fun in spite of all of the glitches i, I wonder if it was just like a rough port job and if a patch or two could take care of some of those issues because like i said i really don't remember issues like that on the xbox version i'm not i'm not sure and it could be it just Port issues like bad cropping on in that one instance, or maybe they have to do some tweaks and optimization in order to have a less chunky frame rate when panning out and looking at the larger universe at play. It's just little stuff like that. I don't know what all goes into the process of porting from one console to another where the switch is involved. And I know that the switch is not as powerful a system in terms of the actual horsepower and hardware goes but we've also seen instances where certain games have been ported from other systems to the switch and it's gone flawlessly so i i can't explain it in this particular case i don't know i, I mean as we all know in every video game creator program there's just a toggle switch for each platform and all you have to do is click that toggle button and it oh, is that immediately it? makes the game 
with no bugs or problems. So uh, it's clearly the program's fault. <laughs> clearly. No, yeah. I I mean they, porting they game. They probably making... clicked the wrong toggle switch. Yeah. That's what it was. Oh, this was the Dreamcast version. Oops. Shit. <laughs> probably looked pretty good on Dreamcast. Oh my god, this would be awesome on Dreamcast. I wonder if seriously. Now I got to talk. Who, who to do we guy. have to? T- who, who do we got to blow to make this happen? <laughs> Uh, I'm sure a lot of people wouldn't mind getting blown, but, uh, see. overall, what is your verdict on unbox on the switch? I give this one a try it. Sounds good. Sounds good. Hopefully whatever issues you run into, they could put out a patch and hopefully take care of some of that stuff. Load times on a solid state memory console. Just, I don't know. I don't get it. Now, Vigi something games. else that, yeah. One thing that does not work in their favor is the fact that this came out on Switch so close to the release date of another kind of minor, unheard of, a little low, niche indie title. Yeah, low rent, um, knockoff. Was bullshit. it? Was it Mario Odyssey? Is, is that the right way to say it? Yeah, I act when I saw the title, I actually thought they were like bringing back an emulator of the old Odyssey console. <laughs> <laughs> and I was really disappointed that it that 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 wasn't what I got, and I I contemplated taking the thing back, but it had this 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 skanky looking princess in it, and my daughter was all like, "Oh, she's pretty," and I couldn't take the game back. <laughs> now here's a question for you, completely off topic from the reviews we got to do. Did Hit you me. get any of the amiibo for Mario Odyssey? All three of them. Did you scan them? I did. And are you wearing nothing but the wedding dress? I don't think I've gotten far enough to the point where it will let me do that. Oh, man. Go. uh, If you've beat like any boss, look for Captain Toad walking around a stage and he'll have like a little robot dude standing next to him. What is it? Uncle Amiibo or something? Something like that. And if you if you scan the Amiibo through him. I don't know if it does it any other way. I don't know if it does it when you scan them any other time, because I've only scanned Amiibos talking to this dude. But there's a... Not dude, this robot. If you scan them with him, he'll give you different outfits for a bunch of different Amiibo. Like, Luigi gives you one. Oh, uh, nice. Diddy Kong gives you one. Waluigi, Wario, Standard Mario, Golden Mario gives you a golden outfit, which is really cool. But if you scan Princess Peach... You get Mario in a wedding dress, and I have worn nothing but that. That is what I want to figure out how to do. Because I know that if you, on the left Joy-Con, if you put push the right D-pad button, the Amiibo thing pops up, yep. and then you scan the Amiibo with the right Joy-Con, and then you'll get something, either invincibility, you'll get heart refills if you use Peach, mm-hmm. or you'll get like this purple marker to tell you where something is hidden if you use bowser but that doesn't get you the costume so you have to do it through the amiibo robot dude yep because if if you do it from the robot dude he'll give you the outfits plus he'll tell you where a moon is in that level that you haven't found nice okay i know what to do next that's that's your pro tip for the night and uh (laughs) final game to talk about now that our mario odyssey tangent is finished is called this is the police Developed by Weepy Studio, published by THQ Nordic, it released October 24th on the Switch. Also for $29.99, a physical release is coming out December 5th. Take the role of a veteran police captain in his final 180 days on the force. Life is rough, and the seedy city around you isn't much better. Will you stick to the law and put your life on the line, or fall to corruption letting your hard-earned reputation slip through the cracks? This is the police is built on narrative choice management where the decisions you make are hold a lofty weight george what did you think of your time as a police officer voiced by duke (laughs) nukem seriously i actually did not know that that was him until i i looked it up at one point because i was so impressed with how that character was acted i had to look it up to see who was voicing it juan saint juan juan saint juan he's got balls of steel and he he nailed the utter shit out of this voice he was he was so perfect for it like i don't i can't think of anybody who would have 
characterized that character who, who could have voiced that character as well as he did because there's a lot of dynamic range for this particular for jack the character and he he, he has a wide range of i guess personality in the game all confined to the crusty old cop and john st john knocked it out of the park that was fantastic the, the, the voice acting throughout the game in general was probably some of the best parts of the game, period, which helped to make the story, which was dark as fuck, really, really compelling to continue playing through this game. Now, having said that, you have 180 days to make your $500,000 and retire. I got to day 95 and I'm trying to convince myself that getting all the way to day 180 is going to be worth it because the days tend to go relatively quick. But good Lord, it I'm 95 days into it and it's getting really tedious, but I really want to finish it. Um, There were I'm doing like I did last time. I'm starting with the stuff that bugged me. Um, <laughs> there were a lot of typos in the scenarios. There were typos in the um, in the in each of the things that pop up during the case management aspect of it, like bizarre little things or omitted words or words that were spelled wrong in the grand scheme of things. Most of the time that didn't make that big of a deal where it caused major problems I found was during the long term investigations where there's a mode where, for example, you're investigating a homicide. And you have you've interviewed a variety of witnesses or people who were nearby. And based on that, you have to take these picture frames and put them in the correct order so that you can determine who would have been the murderer, as an example of one. And in some of the cases, there were incorrect words or typos that made it virtually impossible to figure out the correct order. And in some cases, the order of the frames was absolutely correct. There's no guesswork in terms of which order they should have been in, but it wasn't allowing you to progress, and you had to move a couple of them into the incorrect order in order to progress further, and th 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 that was a little bit on the sloppy side. Interesting. A and, then, and then the spoken dialogue wasn't always matched up with what the dialogue on the screen was. That wasn't a huge deal either. Because that's that's something that I've been seen happening since like Wing Commander three, like little modifications that get made after the voice acting is done. And it's th there's just no way to go back and fix that. So yeah. that wasn't that big of a deal. What I will say, though, is that the option to select your own music was fantastic. The variety of music available to select first on your record player. And then later on your cassette player was Ooh. just bloody fantastic. Everything from jazz to classical to I, I listened to a lot of classical music. I, I found that that calmed me down while I was getting pissed off at finding out that I sent my entire fleet and a SWAT team and a paddy wagon to a cornfield only to find out that the reported terrorist attack was just a bunch of kids with wires and cardboard boxes attached to corn stalks. Um, oh, those little sons of bitches. Those fucking kids. Um, the decision making process in the game in terms of you have all of these things that pop up during the day as the police chief and you have to figure out how to split your shifts up to go handle them. It, it's it's not fair. It's not fair at all. And it feels exactly what it would feel like in real life running an actual department. You, you have situations where your employees are calling in sick for the stupidest fucking reasons. Sometimes they're calling in sick for legitimate reasons, like they ran out of anti-anxiety medication and they're, they're gonna, they're, they're gonna screw up the day and they don't feel like they can comfortably work. It's like, okay, cool. You need to take the day off. Um, the, the jackass that gets drunk and is still drunk, which is shown by a little bottle in the police officer's icon. So I experimented with that a bit. I, I told his ass to get to work and then I sent him out on a mission and then he crashed his car because he was drunk. Um, but then you've got the idiots who are like, 
Um, I was reading a really good book and I didn't quite finish it and I want to get to the end of the book. Uh, can I stay home today? <laughs> Fuck no. <laughs> Fuck no. <laughs> I don't know. I I personally might have given him the day off just for being honest about that. Right. But I already had to give the day off to the officer whose daughter's school caught fire and she was in intensive care at the hospital. So I needed to I let know, him be go. faking that one. He could be faking that one. But Fucking he, kids he knows I'm days. savvy and he knows I'm savvy enough to look up to see if there was an actual art, uh, fire at that damn school. Um. Let's see. What else? I lost my train of thought. Okay. So yeah, like employees calling in sick, stupid shit, false alarms, the leg legitimate, serious problems, um, dealing with different crime organizations, dealing with the fact that having to deal with city hall feels like you're dealing with a crime organization because city hall is just as corrupt as all the rest of them. They're just the ones that got elected. Um, you have, you have different resources for detectives versus general cases with your police officers. They gain experience. They gain ranks. You can train them. Um, you sometimes have a SWAT team available to you and a paddy wagon. And the, it's a it's a resource management game combined with a really dark story. And it's a great melding. And even though it's really tedious at day 95... I'm probably going to get all the way to 180 so that I can say I did it because I'm already more than halfway there. Yeah. And and can't, I can't and, quit now. No, can't quit now. And the actual story story stuff is it's fun to watch, even though it's kind of depressing. And it's that there's there's very little to be happy about in this poor guy's life. It, it, it's really compelling. And I continue to find myself wanting to see what happens next. Someone got a notification. <laughs> Say what? <laughs> as soon as you finish saying that, I just heard do -do -do. like you got some kind of no notification pop up. Oh, I think I saw a Skype window pop up. That'll do it, man. Either that or like a Windows update or something. Oh, it might have been Windows update. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Windows. So Jesus Christ. So before your computer gets four shut down, 30 bucks, what's your verdict? Buy it. Sounds good. Sounds good. So two solid Switch games, and hopefully uh, Unbox gets a patch to handle some of those little issues. I still liked it. I had fun with it on Xbox. I, obviously, I can't speak to the performance on the Switch. Right. That's why you brought me in. And that's why you're here before Skype shuts down and your computer explodes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait for you to hear that section back, and then you'll know why I just lost it. Damn it. But, uh, George, thank you so much for coming on and talking about these games. I love, love, love having you on the show. Uh, it's no no secret to our listeners that I've been having a rough couple of weeks, and you always know how to just make me smile and make things better. So thank you for coming on and talking about these. Just remember, no matter how bad life is, at least your testicles have descended.
Something done stinking here, and I guarantee you it ain't me. 